Uh, okay, so last time, right, so we're talking about homology. So homology comes from a, uh, a chain complex. Right, so a chain complex is a sequence of abelian groups and homomorphisms, usually denoted with boundary, um, such that the boundary squares to zero. Then the nomenclature is that elements of a n are the n chains, elements of the kernel of the boundary, say on a n, are the n cycles, elements of the image, so let's say this is the n, this is the n plus one, are the n boundaries, and the nth homology of the chain complex is by definition the cycles divided by the boundaries. All right, so um, elements are equivalence classes. of cycles, and two cycles are equivalent if they differ by a boundary, right? Because we're modding out by boundaries, right? So for this reason, we say that uh, two two cycles are homologous if they define the same homology class, which is the same as saying they differ by a boundary. OK, so any chain complex, you get homology, um, given a space we define a singular chain complex by taking the free abelian group on all singular n simplices, which by definition these are just maps from the standard n simplex into x. Right. Sigma. The boundary map, say boundary n, is just take the alternating sum of sigma restricted to the ith face. So this satisfies d squared is equal to zero. So we get a chain complex. And the homology of this chain complex is the singular homology of x. OK. So we saw that any map between topological spaces induces a chain map between the singular chains on x and the singular chains on y. Uh, being a chain map means that it commutes with the boundary operator. And we saw that that's all you need in order to get a map on homology groups. So this we sometimes denote by HNF if we want to keep the N in the notation or just F star, especially when we don't care about the N or we want to think about it on all homology groups at the same time. 
<clears throat> this induced map construction satisfies, well, so remember that it's just given by composition. So it's easy to see that if you compose functions, then the induced maps just get composed. And if you take the identity on a space, the induced map on homology is just the identity uh, on homology. So in particular, um, if f is a homeomorphism, then f star is an isomorphism. OK. And we're in the process of seeing that um, homotopic maps also induce the same map in homology. OK. But before we get back to that, are there questions on um, homology in general? Yes. We also talked about like H tilde. Yes. Can you explain again what that is? Sure. So, So it turns out that um, you, ha you have the, the complex given by the singular chains. All right, so this is the singular chain complex. But you can augment it. So we're not going to change anything. over here, but then we're going to add a copy of Z, which you can think of as being like a, a homology group in degree minus one or something, right? So a, a chain um, group in degree minus one, not homology. And the, the homology of this complex, so we proved that, that with the map, the augmentation map we talked about last time, that this does compose to zero. So you still have a complex. And the homology of this complex is called the reduced homology. And it's denoted like this. Right? But since you only change something at the very end, um, what you get is that the homology of the singular chain complex is the same as the reduced homology if n is different from 0. And otherwise, it's this plus a copy of c if n is equal to 0. Right? So all you're doing when you're taking reduced homology is you're looking at the 0 homology group and you're removing a copy of z. Right? So uh, there's uh, we do this mostly for convenience, although it does have the nice feature that um, if, if you look at a, a point, then this is always 0. Right? So it makes it very convenient to, to write down homologies. And generally, um, it, um, it makes it easy to state theorems that would otherwise have to have a special part of the statement for the 0 homology group. Right? So, this is, uh, in a way, a more natural uh, object to use. But it's, it's the same, um, except for a copy of said in degree 0. OK, sure. More questions on uh, last time. Yes? When we're talking about uh, taking the Cartesian product with the interval yes. last time, are we going to talk more about that this time? Yes. Okay. Yes. So whenever we say the homology of a complex, it means all, for all the for all the categories. That's right. So it means the sequence of abelian groups that you get by taking these quotients. Right? Yeah. So if we talk about the nth homology, then it means precisely the quotient that you get from C n or A n. Um, but if we just talk about the homology, we mean all of the groups. Okay. okay. 
More questions on last time. Okay, great. So at the end of class, we were in the middle of trying to establish that if you have two maps, x to y, and they are homotopic, then they induce, well, let's write it like this. They induce the same map in homology. OK, so the idea is that we're going to take a homotopy between them. And construct a map of, uh, of the chain complexes. Right? So what we were doing was a, a prism map. Um, it's going to take a singular n complex on x and give us an n plus 1 complex on y. And the way this is going to work is um, so we're given a map from the standard n simplex to x. And we want to get some, other, some map over here, uh, p of sigma, which should be a map here. Or if not a map there, an element of the free abelian group generated by maps. Right? So we have a construction, which I'll review in a second, that takes a, a singular chain here, uses this homotopy, and gives you um, something in the free abelian group. So a linear combination of maps from the n plus 1 simplex to a y. Right? So the reason we have such a thing said, well, you can take sigma, and since here we're multiplying by i, you can raise, lift this up trivially, just take sigma cross the identity from the n simplex cross the interval to x times the interval. Right? And then you could push that forward with f, just compose with f, to land in y. Right? So that's great, except that the n simplex across the interval is not the n plus 1 simplex. Right? However, we saw that the n simplex across the interval uh, is a union of n plus 1 simplices. Right? So if the vertices of this are v0, v1 through vn, then you're going to get vertices for this set uh, by taking ai to be vi comma 0 and bi to be vi comma 1. All right, so let me just draw the simplest picture if we had n equal to 1 so that uh, the n simplex would just be the interval. Oh, yeah, let me draw here. The interval with v0, v1 as vertices, then the square acquires vertices a0, a1, and then b0, b1. Right? And the square is not um, a two simplex, but if we split it down the middle, then we do get two, two simplices. And um, we can describe these. In general, we have alpha i is going to be, uh, take the a's until you get to ai, and then start with the b's, starting at bi. Right, so in this case, alpha 0 would be what you get from a0, b0, b1. 
right? So these vertices. And alpha 1 would be what you get from A0, A1, B1, right? We saw the case n equal to 2 uh, in detail last time. And uh, I will refer you to the book for a proof that this um, always gives you um, it's easy to see it always gives you decomposition, but it's also true that the, um, that the interiors don't overlap in any dimension, right? So um, the book has a nice proof. It's, it's not hard, uh, but you want to rewrite the um, simplices instead of thinking about um, coordinates that add up to 1, you want to think about it as partitions of the unit interval. And so, so as not to uh, spend time going into that, I'll just refer you to the book. Okay, but, uh, but we have this decomposition. So great, so that's how we're going to take uh, something like this, push it forward along f, and, and get something here. Our map is p of sigma is minus 1 to the i, f composed with sigma cross identity uh, restricted to alpha i. So that's the same as so it's the i, f composed with sigma cross the identity restricted to uh, a0 until a i, and then b i to b n. OK. So. Great. This, this goes from here to here. And we need to know what, it, what happens when you hit it with the boundary. So we started computing. To uh, n plus 1 simplices, right? So when, when n was equal to 1, I ended with two, two simplices, right? So here we're going to get a 0 to n. Um, so we're going to have something different when you're removing an, an a and, some, and then uh, when you're removing a b, right? So if, uh, if j is less than or equal to i, then you're going to have minus 1 to j and this guy restricted to removing the jth a and then we're going to have a similar sum when j is greater than or equal to i uh, this should have been j j plus 1 f composed with sigma cross the identity Okay, so that's what the boundary map is, right? It's very algebraic. Yes. So uh, just to make sure, uh, the, uh, the the indices on p of sigma run from zero to n. Uh, from yes, they run from zero to n, but there's one repeated. Well, the i specifically in in the summation. Yeah, the i's go from zero to n. Because I think I had my notes from last time, 1 to n, and I don't know whether that's what you wrote on the board last time or whether I was just copying it down incorrectly. It's entirely possible I wrote the wrong thing on the board, but it should be from sure zero. We get it straight. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So, so what we want to do is stare at this sum and tease some structure out of it. So let me just focus on the terms with j equal to i. OK? So, so with j is equal to i, then minus 1 to the i minus 1 to the i is, is just plus 1. So here we would end up with, um, let's say, the first term would be uh, f composed with sigma cross identity restricted to uh, remove a0. And then you have b0 to bn. And then the next term, I'm going to have uh, minus 1 to the i and then minus 1 to the i plus 1. So it's definitely a minus sign. 
and I'm going to remove the B, right? So minus F compose sigma cross the identity. And leave A and remove B. All right, and then again a plus sign. And now I'm going to have A0, A1, which I remove, and then B1 to the N, and then a minus sign. A0, A1, remove B1. <clears throat> and so on until at last you'd end up with this restricted to A0 until An, which gets removed, and Bn, and then minus F compose sigma cross. Identity. A0 to An, and then Bn, which you remove. OK, so this is what you get just plugging in, or writing out, rather. And the thing to notice is that it's a telescoping sum. right? Uh, this minus sign corresponds to the next guy with a plus sign. Because here you have the zeros next to each other, and you remove the, the first B. And here you have the ones next to each other, but you remove the first A. Right? So, so this cancels with this. Wait, why does this cancel? Uh, because if you look at what's left, it's A0, B1 through Bn, and A0, oh. B1 through Bn. Okay. Right? And this happens everywhere. That cancels with the next guy, and this cancels with the previous guy. And so all that's left is this guy minus that guy. Right? And here we remove the A, so we just have Bs. And here we remove the last B, so we just have As. Right? So we ended up with F composed with sigma cross the identity at just all of the As, minus F composed with sigma cross the identity at, oh no, Bs here and As here. OK, so sigma cross the identity, but notice this. Let's go to the picture. All of the Bs, that's the top face. And all of the As, that's the bottom face. All right? So if the homotopy started at, um, at G, then this is just G composed with sigma uh, minus F composed with sigma. All right? Or if you like, it's G, um, G sharp minus F sharp applied to sigma. Can you say one more time where you get this G composed with sigma minus? Sure. So um, it's just going to be the top edge, right? So this is sigma times the identity. So if you just restrict to this slice, it's just sigma, right? And then you're composing, you're pushing forward with capital F, which is a homotopy between F and G. So it's just putting G at the top edge and F at the bottom edge, right? So the composition. It's just G composed with sigma. Right? And same thing at the bottom edge, you just get F composed with sigma. OK? Uh, uh, assuming that capital F was doing G at the top and F at the bottom. Yeah. OK, then I'm just going to assert that the terms with i different from j can be identified with minus p of boundary sigma. All right. So I'll leave you the fun task of uh, checking that. All right. So that altogether, Uh, we see that uh, boundary of P of sigma is equal to um, G sharp sigma minus F sharp sigma minus P of boundary sigma. Right? Or better, uh, boundary P plus P boundary is equal to G sharp minus F sharp.
Okay. So this is just the result of um, direct computation by splitting the n simplex across the interval into n plus one simplices, right? But this this is something that comes up a lot. So let's just observe in general. So a useful observation. So let's say that you have uh, two chain complexes. So and h, um, and for every n, for each n, h n from a n to b n plus 1. It's an arbitrary map. <clears throat> uh, homomorphism. Then uh, let's say phi um, phi n from a n to b n given by boundary hn plus hn boundary. Uh, no, so uh, boundary will move you down to n minus 1. And um, this would be boundary n, and this would be uh, boundary n, uh, n plus 1. OK. This is a chain map. with uh, induced map always equal to 0. Okay, So you take any homomorphism, and you construct a map, any homomorphism between here and here, and you construct a map just by uh, pre and post composition with the boundary map, then you'll get a chain map, but it will be trivial in homology. Okay, so why is that? Well, that's easy to see. Uh, first, why is it a chain map? So if we do, so chain map is the same as saying that it commutes with the boundary. All right, so if this is n, then this is n minus 1, and if this is n, this is n plus 1. Uh, no, that's just that. Yeah. Um, so why is that? Well, boundary n of phi n is boundary n of uh, boundary n plus 1, hn plus hn minus 1 boundary n, and boundary boundary squares to 0. Right, so this first term dies. Well, I'll write it out. Uh, boundary squared composed with hn plus boundary n, hn minus 1 boundary n, and this is 0. Right? Um, but so this is just boundary h boundary, and it, if we had done uh, this guy hn plus hn minus 1 boundary n and composed with boundary n, then the same thing would happen, right? But here you get boundary squared on this side. Right, and so you would, oh, n plus 1, um, boundary, uh, oh, that, yeah, I should have changed all of these to uh, n minus 1. So n minus 1, n minus 2, uh, n minus 1, n. There we go. All right, so uh, phi n minus 1 is this. The alarm is happening at 10 on the dot, so it must be a test. <laughs> it is the first Tuesday of the month. That too. OK, so, um, so this is phi n minus 1 boundary n. So we get a chain map right, automatically.
On the other hand, so because it's a chain map, we know that it sends uh, cycles to cycles and boundaries to boundaries, right? But this um, does much better or worse. Um, note that uh, phi of a cycle is a boundary. Right, so if if A is a cycle, so the boundary of A is equal to zero, then phi of A, which is boundary H plus H boundary on A, well, boundary A is equal to zero, so this term kills A. Right? And so we're just left with boundary of H of A. Right? So we took a cycle, and we ended up with a boundary. OK, but that means that the induced map in homology is trivial. Right? So Hn of phi from Hn a to Hn. For me, uh, the way this works is you give me a class, representative cycles. I just take a representative cycle, apply the map, and then take the equivalence class. right? But this is a boundary. This is the class of boundary of H of A. And that's just 0. Right, so, so any map that you construct by taking arbitrary homomorphisms and then pre and post composing with the boundary is going to be trivial in homology. Right, so it's, it's trivially a chain map, but then it's trivial in homology. Right. In particular, Our prism map shows that the induced maps f star minus g star is trivial in homology. Which is the same as saying that these are equal S maps from the singular homology of X to the singular homology of Y. Right. So for this reason, or from this example, let's say. Um, a map P such that boundary P plus P boundary is equal to F sharp minus G sharp for any for two chain maps. F sharp G sharp. So uh, just a sec. D imagine that you have um, just this situation, but you have general chain complexes and chain maps between them, F and G, not necessarily coming from um, uh, the geometry. Uh, if you construct a P uh, such that this happens, uh, then this is called a chain homotopy because it's what you get from an actual homotopy when you're working with geometric spaces. So, yes, chain homotopy. Yes. So on, over there on the left board, you had boundary of P plus P boundary equals G sharp minus F sharp. Oh, sure. And now you have, okay. 
Thanks. Still shows the Dutch. This would be a chain homotopy between these chain maps. Okay. So homotopies give us chain homotopies. And so homotopic maps give us the same map in homology. OK, so an immediate corollary is that if x and y are homotopy equivalent, then their homologies are isomorphic. Okay. Also, the reduced homologies are isomorphic. So I'll let you think through why a map of spaces also gives you a map between the augmented chain complexes and uh, enhance a map between the um, reduced homology groups, right, but with no new information, really. Uh, so in particular, um, if you take Rm, then the reduced homology is trivial because it's the same as the reduced homology of a point. Okay. Or indeed, for, for any contractible x, the reduced homology is to point. Okay, yes. So at the end, you're just removing copy of z. Right? But the way you're doing it is you're taking the, the chain complex, singular chain complex, and you're augmenting it. Right? You're, you're adding one more abelian group. You're getting a slightly longer complex. Right? So to prove this, you need to show that if I give you a map between x and y, then you get a chain map, a chain complex map, between the augmented complex for x and the augmented complex of y. Right? And then that passes to homology, right? Um, yeah. So, right. It's not at all hard to check this, but there is something to check. More questions? Yes. I don't know if we're going to get into this more, but it seems like right now uh, the simplicial homology groups are like so hard to compute. Like even for a point, is there like some way to do it for other non-contractible? Yeah. Funny you should ask. Uh, yeah, that's the next topic. Uh -huh. More questions? OK, uh, great. So indeed, uh, how do you compute this if you don't have, say, a delta complex structure? Or indeed, if you don't have like a finite delta complex structure? Let me make sure I'm not skipping anything. OK, so great. So we come to one of the central concepts of algebraic topology, which is exact sequences. Right. So an exact sequence, as we'll go over in a moment, um, so just remember that the homology 
is the uh, kernel of the boundary divided by the image of the boundary. So the homology is measuring the difference between the kernel of the boundary and the image of the boundary. Right? So exactness is when there's no difference, when the kernel is the same as the image. So these are going to be just sequences where there's no homology. Right? So, but more precisely, um, so if we have uh, a sequence of abelian groups and homomorphisms, And then you have maps. I mean, they don't have, let's say, alpha n plus 1, alpha n. So you just have a sequence. Then we say that this is exact at a n if the kernel of alpha n is the same as the image of alpha n plus 1. Right? So if there's no homology at that place. Right? Uh, the sequence is said to be exact if it is exact at every a n. Okay. So a short exact sequence um, is an exact sequence of the form 0 goes to A, goes to B, goes to C. Zero. Let's say that this is f and this is g. Okay. So we have three abelian groups, and then we have zeros at the end, right? The trivial abelian group, and um, so we don't label this map or this map because there's only one map, one homomorphism from zero into a group, and only one map from c to zero. Right? Uh, so what does it mean for this to be exact? So let's see, exact at A. So I'm, I don't put any condition on, on something that doesn't have maps from both ends. Right? So here I only have conditions at A, B, and C. Exactness at A means that the, um, the image of this map, the image of 0, is equal to the kernel of F. Right? So that just means that f is 0 only at 0, but for a homomorphism, that's the same as being injective. Right? So that's the same as saying f is injective. Exact at b, that means that the image of f is equal to the kernel of g. Right? So you can think of that as saying there's no homology at b. And exact at C says that the um, image of G is equal to the kernel of the zero map. Right? So of course the zero map sends everything to zero. So the kernel is all of C. Right? So this is the same as saying that G is surjective. So a short exact sequence is two maps between three abelian groups where the first one is injective, the second one is surjective, and there's no homology in the middle. Okay. Uh, you sometimes abbreviate and you leave off the zeros. So you put a, a hooked arrow to indicate 
injective and a double-headed arrow to indicate surjective. And so then all that's left is the condition at B. Um, okay, it's worth pointing out um, another case. If we just had a, B, zero, right, then exactness here, this is an exact sequence. OK, so exactness at A, well, that's just like over here. That says that F is injective, right? Exactness at B, well, that's just like over here. That says that F is surjective, right? <laughs> so exactness of the sequence is the same as saying that F is an isomorphism. No, I, I could I could add another zero, and then it's a short exact sequence. Oh, okay. But uh, but no, that would not be a short exact sequence. Yes. So as an example of a short exact sequence, could we, for instance, have B be the direct product of A and C, and then F is just you know an the, the projection, the, the inclusion, setting. and then the projection. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you would take the direct sum because there are abelian groups, which would be the same thing. Yes? Well, yeah. So, what does, um, how does this definition of a short exact sequence uh, relate to the general definition of the, of the chain where you have you know, n, or the, the index of the group I run to? Right. So, um, so, on the one hand, it's a new concept, new definition. We have um, a sequence of abelian groups and homomorphisms. And we're not saying that it's a complex, right? We're defining a new thing called exactness. And you can be exact at one place without being exact anywhere else, right? On the other hand, let's say that the whole sequence is exact. Then it is a complex, because if you compose maps, you get 0, right? But it's, it's much stronger than being a complex, because when you have a complex, you get homology groups. Right? So this is the same as saying, I have a complex, but all of the homology is trivial. Right? There are no, all of the homology groups are trivial. Right? That, that's what exact sequences are. Right? So they're, they're chain complexes with no homology. The short just stands for the number of stuff. That's right. Short exact sequence is just when you have five, but the two at the ends are zero. It just comes up so often, like all the time, bread and butter. Uh, that um, that it has a name. We won't get there, but um, but if this all applies, so cohomology is the dual theory to homology, and it's also the homology of a chain complex. It's, you take the dual complex and then take homology. Ah, uh, a five ninety five. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, I do have some lecture notes on my web page. Just for L2 cohomology. Right. Just by the by. OK. Um, so that's a short exact sequence. You could ask, what is a long exact sequence? Um, so we will be talking about long exact sequences, but it's just a. Um, it's just a, a, an infinite sequence. It doesn't even have to be infinite. It's just a longer uh, sequence. So uh, yeah, there's, that's right. So it's just a longer version yeah, of a short exact sequence. Um, OK, so how, uh, how is this going to show up for computations? Well, um, let's do first the simplest case, or the case with the simplest looking result. And then, um, and then we'll complicate it a little to something we can prove. So a good pair of spaces well, x is a topological space. A is a closed subspace.
such that A has a neighborhood in X that deformation retracts. So the simplest example would be take the interval. So let's say um, take the interval together with its boundary. That's a good pair. So the boundary are just these two points. And of course, if I thicken them up to little neighborhoods, then these neighborhoods deformation retract back to the boundary points. Right? Um, lots of things are good pairs, so, uh, but almost always what we mean when we talk about a good pair is um, if X is a cell complex and A is a subcomplex. then there's a good pair of spaces. OK, so um, why do we care? Well, here's one nice property. If you take x and then you collapse everybody in A, this is still a cell complex. For example. So here's why we bring them up. Wait, sorry, why do we know that x, y is a good pair? Right. So um, I'm not going to show that right now. Okay. It's in the book, but it's really the same, the same reason that the interval and its boundary. So to, if you want to think about it, just thicken up A a little bit, and that will be the neighborhood you need. Um, OK. So. So here's the theorem that uh, we will prove uh, several classes from now. Uh, so if xA is a good pair, there is a long exact sequence. Let me make sure I put the groups in the right order. M plus one tilde of x a tilde of a. Is the long exact sequence just not a short exact? Sequence? Basically, it's just an exact sequence, uh, but we say long. But so, like a short exact sequence is not a long exact sequence. Uh, <laughs> or is it still also? also so, exact? so short exact sequence means something very specific. When we say long exact sequence, we'll almost always mean long exact sequence in homology. And then it means something that looks just like the one I'm about to write. Okay. Right? But otherwise, yeah, long exact sequence, there's not much content there. It's just exact sequence. Okay. Uh, so that maps to uh, Hn of xA, which goes down. OK, so we have this long exact sequence. I haven't told you any of the maps. Uh, so I'm going to put i star there and j star here. i star, j star.
um, where uh, i is the inclusion of a to x, and j is the projection from x to x mod a. Right? So those are geometric maps, and so they induce maps on homology. Right? And then we need maps between uh, the homology of xA to the homology of A. So these, um, confusingly perhaps, are also denoted with boundary. Right? We're stuck with it. That's always how it's denoted. Um, this is known as the connecting homomorphism. So I'll tell you how it's defined, uh, but we'll have to save the justification till later. So how this works, so let's say you have somebody here and you want to go to here. Um, so here I have an equivalence class, uh, some cycle. So what we do is we represent C as a cycle in X with boundary contained in A. Okay, so I have a cycle in X over A. Yes? So the way you wrote the exact sequence, we're going from HN plus 1 of X over A to ah, HN and A? Thank you. Yes, this should be N minus 1. So the things I'm not justifying at the moment is that you can represent uh, this class by a cycle that actually lives in X. It just has its boundary in A. Right? So that's why it, uh, not a cycle in X, a chain. Right? So it's going to give you a cycle in X mod A because everything in A is trivial in x mod a, right? So, so you kill the cycle in x mod a, but the claim is that you can represent it by a chain in x with this property, right? So let's assume that you can do that. Then this map is just take the boundary of such a representative. Right? And so then the thing that will confuse you at first is, if this is a boundary, why isn't it 0 in this homology group? And that's because it's the boundary of a chain in x. It's not necessarily the boundary of a chain in a. OK. So it turns out that just knowing that this is exact lets you do a ton of computations even if you didn't understand what the, groups, uh, what the group maps are, the homomorphisms. Right? So um, let's do an example. So accepting this, consider the disk and its boundary. Right? This is definitely a good pair. Um, so this is s n minus 1. And the quotient is s n. Right? If you take the disk and then you consider all of the boundary a point, you've got a sphere. So, so what's this say? Uh, this says that you have h n plus 1 tilde of xa, hn tilde of a, hn tilde of x, hn tilde xa. And you keep going. OK, so this would be, oh, um, let's make these m's.
Okay, so this would be h tilde m plus 1 of s um, m. This would be h n tilde of s m minus 1. This would be h n tilde of the disk. And then h n tilde of s m. Right. Okay, so now the disk is contractible, right? So its reduced homology is zero, right? So this is zero for every n. So what this really looks like is 0 and then hn tilde of s m h n minus 1 of s m minus 1 and then 0 and then hn uh, minus 1 tilde of s m to hn minus 2 s m minus 1 to 0 and so on. Okay. Now this is exact. This is an exact sequence, so it's exact at every place. Now, like we saw before, exactness here tells you this map's injective. Exactness here, because this is zero, tells you this map is surjective. So these are just isomorphisms. Right. So for every n, h n tilde of S m is isomorphic to h n minus one tilde of S m minus one. Okay, so this tells us that if we know the homology of S m minus 1, then we know the homology of S m. Right? So start with S 0, right, which is just two points. Right? So we know the homology of this guy. The, the homology um, is the direct sum of the homologies of the connected components. And the connected components are just points. right? So h tilde n of s0 is going to be said if n is equal to 0 and 0 else. right? Because you have two connected components. So if you remove one of the sets at n equal to 0, you still have one left. So this is what you get for S0. It follows from here. That the homology of the m-sphere is z if n is equal to m and 0 else. So wonderful, now we have more examples, right? All of the spheres. Sure. So um, let's just compute the, um, the unreduced homology. Right? We showed that the unreduced homology of a space is equal to the direct sum of the, um, of the uh, unreduced homologies of the path components. Okay. Right? You have two path components. So it's just the direct sum of the homology of a point with the homology of a point. And we computed the homology of a point. Okay. Right? It's just a set in degree 0 and nothing anywhere okay. else. Right? So we just get two sets in degree 0 and 0 everywhere else. And so if you reduce, you're just going to get one set in degree 0. Yes? So is this going to be like our minor data for, for 
so Meyer Vitoris is going to be a long exact sequence. It's not this long exact sequence, it's another one. Yes. So Meyer Vitoris is like the Cypher Van Kampen theorem for homology. And it, it, it's in this shape. It's the, you have a, a cover of a, a space into two open sets, and then you get a long exact sequence relating the homologies of the open sets, their intersection, and the total space. Yes? So what can we tell about two spaces that have the same homology? I can say that they have the same homology. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what would you like to say? Uh, I don't know. Well, it seems like when we were talking about the fundamental group uh -huh. spaces, like if two spaces have the same fundamental group, they, like, the loops on the space, on those two spaces are similar in some way. But right, way, so like, here you would say the same thing, but you would say the simplices are similar in some way, yeah. right? The, um, you know, if you wanted to go back to, to um, Poincaré's original idea was you're, you're, you're looking at all of the different sub-manifolds of your space, so, you know, all of the you have a three-dimensional space, and you want to see how, how can I break it up into surfaces, right? Where I'm going to say that uh, two, sur two surfaces are equal if they form the boundary of, of uh, a piece of the space, right? So now, like we saw, that doesn't quite work. You, you can't get away with using manifolds in general. You have to use singular simplices, for example. But that's sort of what you're doing. You're saying that uh, if I break up the space into uh, pieces formed by n simplices, but I consider two pieces equal if they're the boundary of something I can construct with n plus one simplices, then um, I get these groups. So you're sort of saying that. Really, if you want to, uh, to go from algebraic, equation, algebraic uh, equivalence and get something about the spaces, you need the higher homotopy groups. So there the statement is that if you have two cell complexes and you have a map between them, and you know that that map induces isomorphisms of all of the homotopy groups, then that map was the homotopy equivalence. So that's really strong, Whitehead's theorem. Uh, it, it's, uh, next semester. OK, uh, more questions so far? Right. So the answer to how do you compute, it's uh, with long exact sequences. Right. So you, um, in general, in life, you have to be clever about where you get your short exact sequences. But every time you get a short exact sequence, you get a long exact sequence, and then hopefully you can stare at it and, uh, and get the answer you want. Uh, yeah, so we have enough for a, a corollary. This, yeah, I mean, of course, it always depends on Hopefully, you know two pieces of information, you can deduce the third, right? So if, uh, if A and X over A are simple, as they were in this case, then this would be great for computing X, the homology of X. But it could be that you're interested in the quotient space, for example, and you know the other ones. Exactly, yeah. OK, so a corollary is our old friend, the Brouwer fixed point theorem. All right, so um, there is no retraction. From this to its boundary, and uh, hence every map. This to itself has a fixed point. Right, so you remember for the fundamental group, as soon as we knew the fundamental group of the circle, we were able to deduce this for n equals 2. Right, well, now that we know the homology of the spheres, uh, we can deduce this for arbitrary n. Right, so the proof is the same. Uh, if you have a retraction, So assume that we have you know, the inclusion and then a retraction so that the composition is the identity. And then apply homology. So 
So the boundary, of course, is the S n minus 1 sphere. So look at what this says to the non-trivial group. All right, so let's put tildes. Uh, this would be the induced map from I, the induced map from R, and this would again be the identity. All right? This is said, this is said, and this is zero. All right? And there's no way you can factor the identity map through the zero group. So the same contradiction we got to in, um, in the case n equals 2 with the fundamental group. OK. Okay, so now we want to move towards um, towards proving this theorem. Uh, but uh, what we're actually going to prove is um, something where we don't assume that we have a good pair. But then this third group is not quite as geometric as uh, taking the quotient. Right? So let me just define the group we're going to get, and then we'll start proving things next time. So, right, I told you what a, a good pair was. Uh, a pair, XA, always just means uh, two topological spaces uh, consists two topological spaces such that A is a subspace of X. So, If you have this situation, then the, the chain group, the singular chains of A form a, a subgroup in fact, uh, uh, the singular chains of A with the boundary map uh, form a subcomplex of the singular chains of X with the boundary map. Which just means that if you have a singular n simplex in A and you hit it with the boundary, you get a, uh, a singular n minus 1 simplex of A. But because it's a subgroup, we can take, we can define CNXA. So this is going to be the relative chains or the A relative chains, if we want to spell everything out to be just the quotient CNX, CNA. Okay. So since the boundary map uh, sends CNA to CN minus 1A, um, it induces, so since uh, it induces a map from Cn xa to Cn minus 1 xa, where all you do is this is a quotient, so everybody is represented by an equivalence class of sigmas, si sigmas mapping into a, a x. All right, so. Every class is, has a representative here, right? And you just hit it with the boundary. This maps to the boundary, the equivalence class of the boundary. Yeah, well, it's actually the boundary um, 
the equivalence class of the boundary, of course, the boundary lives in the free abelian group on the maps. Right. This is well defined because if, um, if I pick a different representative, it differs by something that maps into A. When I hit it with the boundary, I get something that again maps into A, and so I don't care about it in this quotient either. Uh, this still squares to zero, so we have relative homology groups. Okay, so the long exact sequence that we're going to prove, instead of having the homology of the quotient space, will have the relative homology groups. Right? The intuition is still the same. It's the homology of x modulo a, right? But, but really you're taking the quotient at the level of chains as opposed to at the level of spaces. Right? For good pairs, it, it ends up being the same thing. <laughs> 